This is David Harvey, and you're listening to the Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a podcast that looks at capitalism through a Marxist lens. This podcast is made possible by Democracy at Work. Okay, to, today on the Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, I'm doing something a bit different. Uh, I decided it would be a good idea to have a guest. My guest is uh, Chris Caruso, and uh, I think he's feeling very happy these days because last week he defended successfully his doctoral yes. dissertation. But that's not why we're here. We're here because Chris has worked with uh, dispossessed and poverty, anti-poverty movements uh, over the last 30 years. And I think uh, it's a rather unique uh, resource uh, to talk about those movements, and in particular to talk about uh, the way in which many of those movements are misunderstood and I think uh, underappreciated for uh, their capacities and their powers. So, um, Chris, talk a little bit about how you got into working with uh, poor people's movements. Thank you so much for having me on your podcast, Professor Harvey. Um, so I, uh, I went to college in Philadelphia in the second half of the 80s, and uh, at a time when uh, it was before the latest round of gentrification in Philadelphia had happened. And, you know, I, I met um, both people who were, you know, destitute, uh, poor, living, you know, sleeping rough on the streets, as well as fabulously wealthy students at the University of Pennsylvania where I went. And it was the first time that I had met people on kind of opposite end of the, the income and, and wealth scale. And it, it immediately, uh, you know, all kinds of questions started to arise in my mind from, uh, you know, this contrast. And at the time, uh, it was um, a kind of high tide of activity of the National Union of the Homeless that were homeless people that had been organizing themselves into unions uh, in over 30 cities around the country. And they were doing very militant work um, identifying abandoned HUD housing and urban development owned houses and organizing families to rip the boards off and move families into these homes. Um, they had actually won a concession from the chairman of HUD at the time, Jack Kemp, after the big Housing Now march, who agreed to give 10% of the federal owned housing stock to the homeless, but didn't agree to any particular mechanism how, and as to how that would be distributed. And so um, organized poor people and homeless people took it, that um, uh, distribution mechanism into their own hands by taking over houses, and then they would uh, then appeal for Section 8 housing vouchers and you know basically ask HUD to make good on this 10% pledge. But there was a wave of these militant um, housing takeover movement that was happening across the country at the time, and Philadelphia was their national headquarters. Mm -hmm. And so I literally met um, some of the folks from the Union of the Homeless on my very first day of college and kind of never looked back. And uh, in getting together with them, I mean, did you start to work with students or were you working with them? Uh, how, how did that yeah. how did that bridge get crossed? I first started to do student organizing and I, there was this national conference, uh, an annual conference called the National Student Campaign Against Hunger and Homelessness that I was involved with. And um, quickly saw the limits of this kind of do-gooderism, kind of charity work that had a, a kind of a social justice language to it, but ultimately, um, you know, by being just students alone, um, was really limited. And so, when we hosted this that uh, annual conference in Philly. Um, we uh, basically initiated um, partnering with grassroots organizations of the organized poor, and so including the you know the Philadelphia Delaware Valley Union of the Homeless, the National Union of the Homeless, as well as the welfare rights unions, and you know basically put forward an idea that students should partner with existing organizations of organized poor and homeless people if they wanted to address these issues. They should address you know they should get together with the people who are the real experts on these issues, the people that are actually living them every day, and you know follow their lead in terms of you know organizing strategies and tactics. But one of the arenas in which you've been, uh, if you like, a pioneer has been uh, by bringing in uh, internet capacities mm -hmm. and uh, IT skills and things of that sort uh, 
uh, into the terrain of these movements. And yes. I, I think that uh, that is a, has a very special uh, part of your story. So talk a little bit about how that meshing between the, this interest in the poor people's movements and relating to them and the IT skills which uh, uh, you were working with uh, came together. Yeah, so I had come from um, a, a hacking background. I had come out of um, the kind of very- Hacking is sometimes has this incredible negative right. connotation. <laughs> right, but... well, in, in this sense, this was, you know, in the very early age of kind of, really before the, the World Wide Web, but with the early days of the internet when it was still mostly ARPANET, and you know you could, would connect with like a 300 baud modem, which was so slow you would watch the text spell out each word across your screen. Um, but I was you know very much involved with the early days of the kind of telecommunications revolution and basically taught myself Unix by you know surreptitiously exploring other people's computers uh, online. And I was um, you know kind of self-taught um, programmer and. Um, been you know very involved with uh, this kind of hacking subculture, and you know it was a couple of experiences with the media in particular, and the way in which you know both the Union of the Homeless and the Welfare Rights Union would do you know these very public kind of spectacles that they would be you know simultaneously what they would call projects of survival, things that would meet immediate needs, but also things that would dramatize their plight and the reality of you know millions and millions of poor and homeless people living in the United States that likes to suppress this. And so there's two stories along those lines that you know really um, compelled me to get involved. One was that I was classmates um, with Stephen Glass, who went on to have this big um, scandal. He was this noted uh, fabulous uh, reporter um, who was eventually um, uncovered as to making up his stories out of whole cloth. But um, before he, as a student, he was also doing this, and he wrote a, a story, a, a big cover story for the summer student paper called The Day in the Life of a Homeless. And it was really just, um, you know, stringing together a bunch of, you know, in my point of view, racist and sexist stereotype, racist and classist and sexist stereotypes about homeless people, how they act, why they're homeless. And he basically put his words into the mouths of some local homeless people that would hang out near Penn's campus. So I went out and I talked to those guys. And I said, you know, did you spend, does this guy, Stephen Glass, spend 24 hours on the streets with you? And they're like, we've never heard of this guy. And so um, I actually confronted him with the editor of the Daily Pennsylvanian in their offices. And I said, look, you know, this, this is false. Like, you made this up. Um, and he wouldn't fess up to it. But it, it took the New Republic, I believe, was the publication that finally busted him another seven years before he was found out. Um, but, you know, how e it struck me as just how easily negative stereotypes about poor people can be transmitted via um, the press with no, you know, with no ill consequences. And secondly... There was um, the the big papers in, in Philadelphia were the Philadelphia Inquirer and the Philadelphia Daily News. They uh, announced a new editorial policy with a, a lead editorial called Homeless Hype. And uh, they said, you know, yes, uh, Kensington is the poorest neighborhood in the whole state of Pennsylvania. Um, but, you know, the, the concluding line of the editorial was, you know, what the, what the people of Kensington really need is some peace and quiet. And that these, you know, noisy, unruly protesters who are trying to make a spectacle out of this issue of homelessness are really doing a disservice to their neighbors. And in fact, <clears throat> this homeless hype editorial marked an editorial policy by the papers. And we, we demanded and got a meeting with the editorial staff. And they said, look, you could do whatever you want. You could yell and scream. You could make a big, you know, fit out on the street. You will not get in our papers. We don't care what you do. We're just not covering you anymore. And, you know, this was a shock. I was very naive about right. <laughs> the free, free press and free speech. And, um, and you know, this, this was at a time when the Welfare Rights Union was not receiving any foundation money. It was totally dependent on, you know, have, when they declared a tent city on Fifth and Lehigh in North Philadelphia, it got in the paper and people would come and they would bring food and water and ice. And, you know, it will, the, the fact that they would get some attention in the local paper would activate kind of local volunteer networks that would like physically support the survival of these families doing these efforts. And the inquirer just said, you know, no, none. 
you won't get any attention from us. And so um, we pursued at that time a very aggressive um, internet strategy, um, basically before any other grassroots groups had done it. Um, and we you know, created a website, we created a listserv, I started training um, you know, poor and homeless people how to code HTML, how to uh, edit digital video, and we developed an in-house capacity with the Kensington Welfare Rights Union to begin to tell our own stories and cover our own struggles. And that helped, um, you know, launch this group from a neighborhood organization to a citywide and then a statewide. And eventually, you know, they had um, a voice uh, during the 1996's welfare reform. They were one of the only organized groupings of poor people that got to officially like testify to Congress about the likely impacts of welfare reform. And, you know, they were they got eventually a national international platform in part because of this early and very aggressive uh, internet strategy. And then after that, I founded a nonprofit called Human Rights Tech, and I traveled around the country and world training other grassroots anti-poverty organizations how to use the internet as an organizing tool. Talk about some of those organizations that you worked with. I mean, some yeah. of them have extremely interesting histories. <laughs> I noticed yeah. uh, just last week there was a, uh, an article in the New York Times about the Amokale yes. uh, workers, which is one of the groups you've worked with, and yeah. they still seem to be making a lot of noise. In yes. this case, uh, the boycott of Wendy's yep. on student campuses, on, on university campuses. They're an incredible group of self-organized farm workers in southwest Florida uh, called the Coalition of Amokali Workers, or CIW. And um, we were really the first, my wife and I were basically the first people from outside their community to go down there. And they had been, you know, organizing along more traditional lines and were, um, you know, actually organized a general strike against the growers. But, you know, it turned out that these very large landowners, these kind of land barons in Florida, like, they don't really have a public image to protect. Like, if people said, you know, they're greedy and they treat people awful, you know, it didn't really matter to them. Um, and so, although they did this very militant and brave organizing, including this general strike, it didn't have much of an impact. And so we were doing some research and in a, it was revealed, it was, it was basically like let slip in an agricultural trade journal that at that time Taco Bell was the singeth lar single largest producer of the tomatoes that they picked in Immokalee. Um, and so this gave uh, rise to an idea that, you know, upon doing further research, we found out that um, Taco Bell spent over $220 million a year on an advertising budget that was entirely focused on 18 to 24-year-old HFFUs. That's what it was called in, in their internal papers, which stood for um, heavy fast food users. And so, you know, uh, this was early 90s and still the internet was not, you know, universal as it is today. Right. But, um, you know, it immediately occurred to us, well, 18 to 24 year olds are on college campuses and they are interneted. And so, um, you know, based on some of the experience with uh, the Homeless Union and with the welfare rights work in Philadelphia, um, we did a, a, you know, a very aggressive internet strategy where we trained, you know, farm worker activists to develop their own web pages, to do digital video editing, um, to create their own, uh, you know, basically do their own storytelling. And they did this series of interneted bus tours where they filled the bus with farm worker activists and went to different college campuses. And they also, we helped create a whole uh, online resources for if you were on a college campus and you wanted to take up this Boycott Taco Bell campaign, all the tools would be available for you to download, right? Uh -huh. The signs, I the see. slogans, the yeah. organizing guide, the sign-up sheets. Everything was there for you to just download. And so, you know, in many cases, you know, the CIW folks would go and they would, you know, either give lectures or they would do a kind of popular theater to dramatize their situation. You know, they had literally, um, you know, get paid on a piece rate that hadn't changed, you know, in over a generation. And, um, you know, grueling, literally backbreaking labor. Um, and, you know, these students would get excited by, you know, hearing directly from farm workers, and then they would follow up with these online tools. In some cases, the CIW would get, you know, an email or a phone call from a student on a campus they never visited. 
and said, well, I heard about it from my friend that was at you and you were at this other campus and I downloaded all these online tools. I got together with, with my friends and we organized a, a, a boycott of Taco Bell and we've kicked them out of our campus. And they you know, had never met. Um, and this was one of the things that really struck me with how powerful this, you know, the potential of these yes. kind of viral yeah, right. campaigns uh, were. Right. And what happened in the Taco Bell case? Well, I mean, it's it's a really striking victory that I think is not talked about enough that they, you know, not just with Taco Bell, but with a whole series of fast food companies, got them to uh, take responsibility for the labor conditions in their supply chains. And so the demand was to get, to pay a penny more a pound um, per a bucket of tomatoes that was picked and to guarantee that that penny be um, transferred on to the workers themselves. And now, of course, the farm workers don't work for Taco Bell or, or Wendy's, right? They work for these local kind of day labor, labor contracts, labor contractors. But um, this was a really precedent-setting victory in that these companies were um, were forced to take responsibility for the labor conditions and the pay further down in this subcontracted supply chain. And you know, part of the pressure um, upon them was that the, the CIW independently uncovered, I believe as of today, it's now six different modern day slavery rings operating in the US South, um, where literally right. people were chained inside of you know box trucks at night. There was labor discipline by, you know, AK forty seven here in the United States in the agricultural fields. And we're, you know, they literally were saying to, you know, uh, Taco Bell, how can you guarantee that slaves didn't pick the tomatoes that are in your chalupas? And, you know, they couldn't. They couldn't guarantee that. And so they agreed to this code of conduct, this kind of industry-wide code of conduct that now um, you know, many fast food chains as well as now many grocery stores have agreed to and have adhered to. And it's not only um, almost doubled farm worker wages for the first time in literally 30 years, but it's radically changed the labor conditions in the fields and their ability to you know, file grievances about abuse or sexual harassment or not being allowed bathroom breaks or water um, is much greater today than it was when, you know, before they, they started organizing. One of the things you've, uh, you know, I think uh, helped me understand much better is uh, the capacities and powers of some of these movements, that uh, the tendency to think that uh, poor people don't have the skills and the capacities to do things and it needs a sort of uh, do-gooder outside organizers to come in and organize them so that they get a better life. But yeah. much of your work suggests that that's a very false imaginary and, in fact, potentially very damaging uh, to the movements themselves. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Because I think this is a very, very significant uh, point. Yeah, and, and I think it's you know a very important point from all of these various organizations that I've worked with is that you know in the United States we we imbibe this heavy amount of propaganda and especially about this idea that there's something called a meritocracy, right? And then if you work hard and you have the right skills, then you're going to succeed. And if you haven't succeeded, then you know, it's your fault as an individual. And, you know, partly, you know, if we acknowledge that there are really, you know, structural reasons for the increased poverty and inequality in the United States, which I think your work speaks to um, quite powerfully, um, we also have to acknowledge that this, these ideas of meritocracy are part of this ideological superstructure that justifies this, this inequality. And in fact, you know, there is real genius uh, on the streets of the United States that people who have to hustle and struggle and work, you know, many part-time jobs and have to put together side hustles and have to figure out ways to support extended families. Like, these are people who work very hard, who are, you know, very resourceful, although resourceless. Um, and in fact, you know, when people are put in a situation where um, you know, they have to fight for them and their family's survival and that the state has made their survival illegal, right? That for them to do the things they need to do to, to survive, they're going to have to come in conflict with the police. They're going to have, you know, the um, health and human services threaten to snatch their kids away for being vocal and being organizers. That, um, you know, my experience, the experience of, of these organizations has shown that there is, you know, literal genius among the ranks of poor and homeless in the United States and that um, 
they have come up with, you know, time and time again, which is what I tried to document in my dis dissertation, you know, very creative and innovative organizing strategies and tactics, um, you know, and to find real even policy solutions for the problems that face them. And I think that too often people, um, you know, discount those at the bottom. You know, I think, uh, you know, are dismissed as the lumpen proletariat or, you know, the, these these folks that you, you know, you can't do much about, right? And I think that, um, unfortunately, uh, a lot of otherwise well-meaning academic literature kind of reinforces those kind of harmful stereotypes. And I think that, um, you know, if folks would take the time to, you know, get to know or even read about, you know, some of these incredible victories like the College of Immokalee Workers or, you know, the um, Michigan Welfare Rights Union that uh, blew the whistle on this horrible combination of water privatization and this emergency manager system in Michigan that if folks had heeded their call, you know, we could have avoided this mass poisoning that happened in Flint, Michigan. They, they developed a citywide water affordability um, policy that could literally solve the water affordability crisis in Michigan. It's been actually implemented by the Detroit City Council, but they have, you know, basically, I mean, it's been passed by the Detroit City Council, but they've slow walked the implementation of it. And so, I mean, I, I think that we really have to look at, you know, the fact that not just the the reality of the poor in the United States is blacked out of our media in terms of the suffering and deprivation of the 140 million people that live below the Census Bureau's supplemental poverty line, right. that not just the, the plight, but also the fight in terms of the struggle, the self-organization, and the insight in terms of yeah. the original analysis, strategies, and thinking that are coming from the bottom are things that I think really need more attention. But there's an extensive uh, literature in the academic world and elsewhere, which is about uh, how to understand poor people's movements and how to organize uh, the poor and so on. But you found yourself very much at odds with that, right? I mean, and so what would you say to them? Yeah, I do. And say, and say yeah. to us who, who reads that literature and, right. and, it, and it has a certain credibility. Yes. Yeah. Well, um, you know, uh, this weekend uh, we celebrated the life of uh, Beulah Sanders, who was a leader of the welfare rights movement here in New York City. And New York actually recently acknowledged her by renaming a street in Harlem after her. She was a, a poor black woman, no formal education, who you know rose to be uh, one of the uh, or rose to be the the leader of the National Welfare Rights Organization, and you know they uh, welfare rights followed what they called a Johnny Tillman model of organizing, and Johnny Tillman was a, a poor black woman who grew up in the South. Later was organizing in California, and the Johnny Tillman model stated that you know. We want to take the people that are most directly affected by an issue. We want to give them the training and tools that they need and put them in the leadership of the position, right? right? That, that though, the idea is that those who are in pain know when their pain is relieved, right? And that um, this Johnny Tillman model was at odds with um, a different kind of organizing model, which is more in the tradition of Saul Alinsky and is more in the tradition of the kind of U.S. labor movement and their model of organizing. And I think, you know, when you look at something, a text that be has become canonical, like Francis Fox Piven and Richard Clower's Poor People's Movements, um, you know, they have a very normative version of what uh, organizing poor people should be, right? Yeah. And they're they, pretty uh, paternalistic. Really. I, yeah, I would say that it is paternalistic, right? And that there is this idea that, you know, you should have these paid professional organizers out of the college campuses. You know, they're the ones with the skills. They have the hustle. They could really get things done. And too often, you know, the actual poor people are left to kind of, you know, give testimonials and tell their sad story. But then it's it's someone else's job to explain the significance, to explain the strategies, to explain, um, you know, how how we get out of this situation. And I think, you know, it is a paternalistic uh, kind of model. And, you know, uh, Piven's argument was that, you know, if if they could just, if, if welfare rights focused 100% of their time and resources on flooding the welfare rolls, on just signing new people up for welfare, it would somehow crash the system and it would force people to, you know, understand, you know, how great of a problem, you know, poverty is in the United States. And they would do something, 
even more generous, um, which of course never happened. But the, the price of pursuing that strategy meant that if you were going to put any resources towards leadership development for your own members to help your existing members get through the crisis of their day so that they could, you know, become leaders in this work, um, that any effort towards, you know, ongoing political education or the building of permanent organizations to build power for the poor was anathema to the Piven view. We just need to, you know, the poor are to be mobilized. They're to be mobilized to be a disruptive force in society, but they're not there to do the thinking, to do the analysis, or to give the leadership. And I, and I, I think it is a paternalistic model, and I, I think it's high time that we begin to start to question some of this kind of received wisdom of, um, you know, who of how organizing poor people gets done. And I think, you know, in many of these cases, there were these were real fights that happened within the organization, right? And if you look at the leadership, you know, of these poor black women like Marion Kramer. Uh, in Detroit, like Johnny Tillman, like Beulah Sanders, like Dottie Stevens in Massachusetts, um, uh, many, many others, um, they, you know, they fought against this position of Pivens. And they said, look, like we are following this Johnny Tillman model. But, um, you know, Piven had the access to academic publishing. She had the degrees. She had the, you know, the kind of intellectual capital to be able to say, here's the definitive story without ever, you know, revealing that there's another side of this story and that we should be giving, you know, these poor black women leaders who are on the front lines of welfare rights for decades a voice in telling that story of how to organize the poor. I mean, this uh, helped me understand uh, when I was in Baltimore, I was participating some in the uh, uh, living wage mm -hmm. uh, movement, which was uh, organized by an Alinsky organization. And, uh, you know, we got some things done. And they, yeah. you know, Baltimore was the first city to actually have a, an ordinance about uh, living wage. So uh, some things were produced. But I always felt uncomfortable with uh, this version that somehow or other, while the rhetoric was about training people to work for themselves, it seemed that the people who were training never went away. <laughs> they, they stayed there. They stayed there right. forever. Yes. Uh, and, and, and in fact, I realized that there was something not quite right about it, but it wasn't, it wasn't totally uh, ineffective. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, an interesting other example that was happening in Baltimore around the same time was this welfare rights leader um, by the name of Annie Chambers, who right. was like, right. an I mean, an <clears throat> incredible organizer, deeply, deeply, deeply rooted in the community. She funded her organizing by selling um, those frozen push-up pops you put in your freezer. And her children, which she had many, um, would go door to door and sell these push-up pops, which funded welfare rights. And at, at the time when welfare reform was happening, she invited the governor. You know, the governor was saying, you know, we, we need more austerity and, you know, all of this welfare queens kind of uh, racist and sexist rhetoric. And she, you know, challenged him. She invited him, you know, come have dinner with a, um, you know, with a poor family in, in Baltimore. And, and to his credit, he did. And he showed up and all of the cameras showed up and they have, you know, a cordial um, debate about policy over dinner. And then he gets up and gives this very paternalizing uh, thing of, you know, well, these, you know, folks, it's very simple, but, you know, they live with dignity and blah, blah, blah. And this just proves that, you know, I could make these cuts and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so she then... Um, returns from the kitchen with a tray of open dog food containers that she had used to make the meatloaf that the governor had just eaten with her. Oh, and she had said, Governor, <laughs> this this is what we have to do to stretch a dollar in order yes. to feed our yes, families. Yes, yes, right? this, yes. is, this is our reality. This yeah. is our lived reality. And now you've enjoyed that too. And of course, his handlers immediately right. you know, <laughs> got him the heck out of there um, because he didn't know what to say. But I think you know, that is a very um, creative and direct and uh, militant style of organizing that um, you know, doesn't, right. hasn't right. gotten its due right. in these histories. One last uh, quick question. Yeah. Um, I can't imagine that you encountered Marx at the University of Pennsylvania. Where did you first come in contact with Marx? 
Yeah. So I was a, a philosophy undergraduate at the University of Pennsylvania in Ivy League school, and I was never assigned a single page of Marx in four years as an undergrad. The first time um, someone handed me a copy of the Marx Engels Reader, it was a, um, a poor, homeless, black Muslim youth uh, living in a takeover house that I, as a student, was doing like support for. I was like bringing food, bringing water, bringing ice to the house that his family this t had taken over with um, the unit you know, of the homeless. And he um, he handed me this copy of the Marx Engel Reader with a beautiful inscription about you know having to understand the root causes of the things we were fighting. And that was that was how I got turned on to Marx and you know a more structural analysis of, of all of these problems I was facing. Okay, well let's leave it there and we will take up that question uh, next time. Thank you. Thank you for joining me today. You've been listening to David Harvey's Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a Democracy at Work production. A special thank you to the wonderful Patreon community for supporting this project.